Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about geeks and science with Ken Denmead from geekdad.com. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode number 113, recorded Thursday, September 22nd, 2011. Geek and nerd. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is the hour that we spend talking to an expert in something about science. And so I hope you're all ready to dig in, because we're going to get dirty today into the science of... Wait, science? We're going to be talking about geeks. We're going to be talking about geeks and science. Our guest today is the geek dad, Ken Denmead. And we're going to be talking with him today about a whole, whole mess of stuff. I'm really looking forward to that. But first, as always, a few science headlines. Let's get to it. Researchers working with great and blue tits outside of Oxford suggest that the birds solve problems better as a group than as individuals. They used RFID tags to identify individuals in the flock and set up feeders with a series of levers that the birds had to pull in order to obtain sunflower seeds. Needless to say, the researchers needed to refill the feeders more often as the flock size increased. Creating a more efficient saltwater battery might be a matter of adding bacteria. A paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences details the creation of a water-based electricity source that uses bacteria to massively increase the efficiency of the system, making it powerful enough to liberate hydrogen. That's right, water-based, bacteria-powered hydrogen production. While the platinum-based cathode might make your wallet ache, rest easy knowing that at least the bacteria can eat on the cheap. People have become satellite trackers this week thanks to news that NASA's Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite has fallen out of orbit. It's going to return to the planet sometime this Friday or Saturday. The UARS should be mostly destroyed as it passes through the atmosphere, but some 26 pieces might be robust enough to actually survive re-entry and crash back to Earth. If you come across one of these pieces of debris, don't touch it. It's Evo. A study in the Juron, journal Neuron reports that zinc plays a crucial role in regulating communication between neurons in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved in the formation of memories and processing of spatial memory. The study also has implications for controlling the occurrence of epilepsy. In case you were wondering, the search for an anti-aging pill is going to take just a little bit longer. For years, researchers have followed the trail of a protein called SIR2, one of a family of proteins called sirtuins, in the hope that it might be used to extend human life lifespan. However, a recent paper in Nature suggests that the protein pathways are more likely responsible for laboratory, the, the pro protein pathways are the different protein pathways, sorry, I didn't read that right, are more likely responsible for the laboratory longe longevity effects observed in flies and worms. So it's very possibly something else. Gamers use the online protein folding game Fold It to discover the structure of a protein involved in retroviral growth called MPMV retroviral protease. The protein is part of the Mason Pfizer monkey virus, which is a retrovirus like HIV, meaning that the virus inserts itself into a host's DNA. Understanding how it, will, how it is structured will help in the design of antiretroviral drugs. Quantum computers 
just came a little bit closer to reality. Computer scientists at UC Santa Barbara revealed the first quantum computer with von Neumann archi architecture like modern computers. The, de the design uses superconducting quantum logic gates, a quantum bus, and stores quantum bits as counter-rotating currents in a circuit. The computer still lacks sub substantial processing power, but the promise of massive parallel calculations is still there. And finally, physicists at CERN in Switzerland have reported news that could shake the very foundations of physics. If correct, the unbreakable speed limit of light might be breakable after all. Neutrinos were detected arriving at an experimental detector some billionths of a second faster than expected, making them 60 nanoseconds faster than light. We'll see if this result is too good to be true. And with that, I'll take you to a word from our sponsor. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to your TV, directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access Netflix, uh, these streaming movies and TV shows. You can watch t Netflix movies and shows on your Mac, your PC, your iPad. You can even watch them on your iPhone or your Android device. If you have a gaming console, like an Xbox 360, a PS3, or a Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. If you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box. They're pretty inexpensive and fairly easy to use, easy to set up too. And with Netflix, you can watch movies, TV shows instantly with any of these devices. Also, you can start on one device. And if something interrupts you, you have to go somewhere. You can stop watching and then pick up watching the show where you left up off on a completely different device. So you're not tethered to one specific location. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies as you want, any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. Try Netflix today for 30 days for absolutely free. Go to netflix.com forward slash twit. That's right. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for Netflix. Use netflix.com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. All right, back to the show and on to the main attraction. Today, we're talking geeks and science with Ken Denmead. Ken is a husband and father from the San Francisco Bay Area. This is according to the bio on his, on his blog, where he works as a civil engineer. He's the publisher and editor of Geek Dad, the parenting blog, blog for Wired Magazine's online presence, publisher of the companion blog, a Geek Mom, where along with a group of other dedicated geeky parents, he posts projects, book and movie reviews, weekly podcasts, and more about being a parent and being a geek. His newest book, The Geek Dad Book for Aspiring Mad Scientists, is going to come out in November. Ken, thank you so much for joining me today on the Science Hour. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm glad we were able to, to connect this morning on Twitter and make this happen. Me too. Yeah, it was, it was rather funny. Funny story. Funny story happened today on Twitter. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was searching for information about what Ken was up to because I was like, oh, I could talk to Ken and see if he would be interested in being a guest. And lo and behold, he was already going to be on TNT <laughs> with Tom Merritt. This is my, my day of twit. Right yes. here. Yes, we're gonna we're just we're just gonna keep you here. We just want to has there ever just has there ever Skype been a, a guest on multiple shows on the same day at Twit? I wonder. I don't know. I think that's a good trivia question. Chat room, check your trivia books for Twit. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> See if it's happened before. All right. So, science, geek, science. You're writing. You've written a book book for aspiring mad scientists. Aren't nerds supposed to be scientists? Like. It, what, are we getting our nomenclature mixed up here? Well, you know, it's, it's difficult nomenclature. And, they're, the, the, and through having been, you know, running Geek Dad for so long and writing these books and, and talking to people from all over the United States and the world, uh, you know, the terminology is actually kind of fluid. It's sort of like, you know, who, who calls soda soda? Who calls soda pop? Who calls, you know, uh, geek means different things in different corners of the country and different places in the world. What we generally at the blog like to think of it as is you're a geek if you're obsessive about something, uh, possibly to the point where it, you know, makes, uh, it causes you social detriment at some point in your life. And, and I think science 
can be a big part of the geek experience. Um, you know, science fiction definitely is, and anyone who's, who's deeply into science fiction usually already has a solid grounding in science fact. Absolutely. There's, I, I, I love the, the genre of hard science fiction, where, it's, where a lot of the writing actually does come from physicists. Who are, exactly. You know, I mean, starting with Arthur Clarke yeah. and going forward with the, from the, the folks in the Golden Age, the people, you know, he, he was doing real science at the time that he was writing some fantastic stories. And he, you know, invented some real hard science concepts that are with us to this day. Yeah, and with science fiction, we also oh, there's the question always of which drives the other. Is it science driving science fiction? Is it science fiction driving science? And I really think there is kind of a um, uh, an Ouroboros kind of effect. Uh, you know, the 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 snake chasing its tail. That it, I, they both. I definitely exist like together. to think. I definitely like to think that anything that we can imagine will be possible somehow, someday through through technology or whatever else. I mean, that's why. I think you're seeing such excitement today over this announcement of, about the neutrinos. Whether whether or not there's something there, um, you know, you know, half the people were going, "Wow, we found it." Half the people are going, "No, they've made a mistake somewhere." And, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm sitting on the fence right in between. But I like to think that this may be one of those situations where we've discovered something unexpected. You know, I think the, the coolest things that, that happen in science usually happen by accident. Yeah. And so whether or not this is actually uh, these particles going faster than the speed of light mm -hmm. or some other effect that we have not, you know, seen before, uh, I, I kind of like the latter thing. I, I always assume that if we ever do achieve faster than light travel and, and I think I think we will somehow someday it's going to come through some accident where we discover some little loophole through the the, the laws that we understand loopholes now loopholes in physics you think there are absolutely <laughs> absolutely well no you know what there's just stuff that we haven't discovered yet yeah and you know the the the, the pot into which all of that falls is probably you know, so many orders of magnitude larger than the pot of stuff that we do know now that it's it's just going to be a fun ride over, you know, over time sorting all this stuff out. Yeah, so let's talk a minute about the uh, the neutrino um, finding. Um, it, the report was actually put out, but it's not, they're not saying this is an actual discovery yet because they're they're interested in finding out what the rest of the, the scientific community, their peers, thinks about it they're like we're stumped we can't get right. rid of it <laughs> they're, they're playing it i mean th this is good they're playing it smart you know th nobody's uh jumping up and down and saying we've figured something out and that's appropriate for science it's it's more a matter of okay you have a bunch of extremely smart people who designed a very specific experiment the results of those experiments are have left them scratching their head they have probably spent days, weeks, months since they started seeing this effect, trying to figure out what they did wrong because it's, it's going against what, whatever they, they expected out of this. It's, it's completely different. So the first assumption is, is, and the best assumption is, all right, what did I get wrong first? Mm -hmm. And so I think they've probably exhausted their ability to, to review that and come up with an answer to that question. So now they're, they're very cautiously stepping their, their toes in the water and saying, okay, we've seen this. We've repeated it. Mm -hmm. um, we've figured, we, we've done everything we can do to figure out what could be wrong, and we haven't, haven't found anything wrong. So please, somebody else with the same equipment and know-how, try it and see what you get. Yeah, there was a, uh, according to an article on MSNBC, uh, there's uh, an experiment from 2007 at Fermilab that had similar faster than light results, but came with a huge margin of error. So they've, they've seen this faster than light result, but the margin of error was too big to be able to say, okay, this is anything more than just a random occurrence, that this right. is our fault somehow. But this time around, they've got a much tighter tolerance, and so... Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Ooh, and <laughs> it could overturn everything. Okay, as, as an engineer, science, science is a lot of experimentation. It's, the, the, that search, it's like a toolkit, right, for figuring out how things work. And I, I, I think of engineering as like the application of that understanding. Um, 
how would changing one of the main the main um, uh, the main pillars of physics affect you and engineering? Well, pro you know, me at being a being a, a civil engineer, probably not a heck of a lot because yeah. most of the stuff that I deal with has been sorted out and and written down and built and fixed and built better over tens, dozens, hundreds, thousands of years. So at the, at the ground level, not so much. Now, something on this magnitude, they've, they've discovered or they have potentially discovered particles that can travel fast, you know, ac actual things with mass traveling faster than the speed of light. Um, well, first of all, uh, we have to see what that really does mean, what it affects. Does that suddenly... Uh, mess with every single other piece of math that has to do with the speed of light and uses uses C in part of its calculation. You yeah, know, maybe not. Maybe this is a very special situation. So, it, but again, you know, then there are possibly very interesting applications to it. If you've got, you know, is is it just a set speed faster than light? Or you know, this this discovery that they were what showing up fifty nanoseconds, sixty nanoseconds, 60 nanoseconds. faster from point A to point B than the photons. That actually seems, what, what is that as a percentage of the speed of light? Where the, you know, there, there's my question. We're talking this. <laughs> it's, it's nothing, <laughs> it's so minuscule. Um, and that, yeah. that, that actually is a, um, a point that um, a, a physicist brought up on a blog that I, that, that I found, um, the reference frame. There's a, um, a a physicist from the Czech Republic, Lubos Motol Pilsen, who has uh, written kind of a rebuttal about this superluminal neutrino opera. And um, he said that the they're looking at six times. So their, their margin of error was 10 nanoseconds. And they had um, the, the neutrinos arrive 60 nanoseconds. So six times their margin of error, which made it significant. But in the scope of things, it's this kind of it's it's this unbelievable number like why isn't it bigger why didn't it, why didn't they get there a lot faster why what why is it not um he he basically says if you would think if, if it were going to be more believable as something that's that's true that the that, that neutrinos can travel faster than the speed of light that um that you'd think it would be much higher much larger than their their margin of error, at least a lot. Yeah, I mean, how much how much six. energy were they putting into these neutrinos? What is you know, there's a very minuscule but but actual mass to the neutrinos, so you ought to be able to figure out, you know, what force does it take to accelerate them to a certain speed? How much energy were we putting? You know, what what it, it, there's lots and lots of math. Yeah, that of they should be it. able to figure it out, but it's doing something crazy. Um, I don't know. We, I think I think this is going to be interesting to see over the next weeks and months. Uh, you know, it's going to be a little heartbreaking if suddenly someone goes, "Oh, you forgot to move the one and carry the three and do that," or you, you know, centimeters versus yeah. inches or something like that. But exactly. Uh, it, you know, on the other hand, that th we could just be seeing the the next step in in an amazing. You know, f first the science gets done, and then. The engineer, you know, th then it starts getting applied. And if, if we've got something here, you know, wh what does it mean for quantum computing? What does it mean for uh, faster than light communications? Mm -hmm. Who knows? You know, lot, you do Morse code with neutrinos that faster than light. You could, we could be talking with, uh, we could talk uh, with, with our things. grandmothers. <laughs> there you go. I like that. <laughs> you go faster. I mean, isn't the idea there? You go faster than light, you go back in time. So, you know, we could be sending neutrinos back in time to kill Tom Merritt's grandmother. Not right, that I would but... want to do that or anything, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to send messages back in time because nobody would be listening. Yeah. We could send but now them, we but no, there would be no and catchers. See whether, yeah. Yeah. Now we can start listening and then see if anyone's contacting us from the future. Exactly. We should. All right, physicists, get on it. Or engineers. <laughs> engineers. Engineers, get on it. Build that neutrino detector for the <laughs> <laughs> the communication sector. Dot 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 dot. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. It, it'll get here exactly. So tell me that. I mean, I love stuff like this. Tell us a little bit about um, you know what what you do with Geek Dad. If people aren't familiar with the blog and and um, you know the kind of stuff that really gets you excited to to cover. You know, we, we it's. 
it's a very broad scope on Geek Dad, really. It's, it's, our mandate is whatever we as geeky parents find interesting, and it can be just geeky stuff, it can be just parenting stuff, or it can be that the, the magic uh, intersection of the two. And so there you go. There's, there's our, our blog for today. First of all, you're seeing you know the classic Dork Tower comic strip by our good friend John Kavalik, who writes all about gamers you know we we love the role-playing games the the rpgs the good board games and things like that video game reviews but we'd love to see the science stuff coming through too and and you know our our biggest concern is uh we're happy being geeks we have all of these interests that may not necessarily be in the mainstream but are important we love science and education and we're trying to figure out the best way to impart these things to our kids in ways that they'll be excited about and part of that is why the geek dad books came to be because basically they are uh, collections of projects some of them that i've designed some of them that were come up with by writers on the geek dad and geek mom blogs that are things that you can do with your kids they're they're sometimes zany sometimes crazy games and projects but usually somewhere buried deep in them are um some scientific principles something really uh interesting that you can learn out of the experience uh, for example, upcoming, you know, the, the, the one that's coming out in November the, is actually full of specifically science experiments that you can do at home with your kids from building the classic, uh, well, they, they, technically, I guess it's, it's, more, it's better known as a uh, foxhole radio, mm -hmm. but we like to call it the MacGyver radio because you can basically <laughs> build it without power. You don't need yeah. power to listen to radio. Yep. And that's something that may actually surprise and shock some parents and just be something really neat and cool to do with your kids is just, you know, wind some, wind some wire around a few, you know, a few dozen times and get the right kind of headphones, earphones and tune it just right. You can listen to radio without needing a battery, without needing to power anything. Um, there are ways to detect particles. You know, right. build yourself your own little cloud chamber. Right. Is that using the uh, smoke detector? Uh, actually, it? it's um, uh, uh, some uh, frozen CO2. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and just see uh, see particles uh, decaying off of, you know, you can, it, it's, it, it's funny and a little bit scary, but there's plenty of places online that you can buy radioactive you know, safe material. radioactive isotopes yeah. so that you can you can you can watch this stuff. And so it, it's a bunch of projects like that. Things from from a little bit of a hero's engine, so you can explain pressure and energy, to um, I don't know stuff with light, stuff with uh, stuff with water, watching uh, you know playing with uh, uh, fluids. And the Diet Coke and Mentos experiments. That's always and fun. Do you do the? Do you do the? I know a microwave. You can use a microwave to determine the speed of light. I love. Yeah, that's <laughs> that was actually in my first book. Okay. Um, right. Just because it's such a cool experiment, and it, it just it, it'll knock your socks off that you can do it. You you put a put a bar of chocolate or, or any piece of chocolate in there, and it can work with other materials. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be chocolate, but you know it tastes better when it's chocolate. It definitely and, works. <laughs> and. You make sure it's not spinning around. You know, you take out that little spinny plate in the microwave so that the piece of chocolate will just sit in one place. And because of the way microwave ovens work, they're they're beaming waves that go up and down and up and down, and they and they meet and they create hot spots. And that's how it heats up the molecules in whatever food you're putting in there. Well, those hot spots don't move. Those hot spots stay put. And usually the food's moving around, so you're moving the food through the hot spots or, or moving food through the places where the hot spots can be created. Um, you just have the chocolate sitting static. You're going to see hot spots pop up at regular intervals across the surface of the chocolate. Chocolate's easy because it, it, usually it's a matte surface, and you can very easily see where, the, where it starts to melt in these little right. po points. So you measure the distance between every other point, and that's the wavelength of the uh, the microwaves that are being beamed at it. You use that if you know the, the the power rating of the microwave and one silly mathematical constant, and you can verify what the speed of light is. 
Yeah, I think it's such a it's such a great experiment. It's like in your kitchen, almost everybody has microwaves or you know somebody who does. You can, you know, actually verify the speed of light, which I think is just it, it's just great. I mean, that's yeah. hands-on science, which is, you know, there's we need more and more opportunities to do that. Um, in terms of with leaf blowers right now because you can hear them outside here, but uh... <laughs> leaf blowers work on they're converting uh, electrical energy to kinetic energy. Actually, actually there's, there's one more experiment in the new book is or actually it's 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 less than an experiment, more more the practical side of building your own wind tunnel. Oh, nice. Using you know a fan or uh, or some sort of blower and just some some piping and stuff so you can make your own. Make your own wind tunnel and then experiment on, you know, build the most aerodynamic uh, uh, car for your, uh, the, what is it, soapbox derby, not soapbox, the, the, the pinewood derby cars or yeah, things or like that. Or you could do like a bunch of uh, hummingbird scientists did a couple of weeks ago. They uh, recorded, they, they put hummingbird feathers, tail feathers in a wind tunnel and then recorded the sounds that the feathers made because the uh, hummingbirds that use their feathers to as part of the calls that they make as part of the the mating ritual so it's, yeah wind tunnels can be used for cars planes bird feathers exactly your little brother <laughs> <laughs> i did not say that <laughs> that might be where the the, the we've got the uh, uh, a build for the rubens tube in oh, the book too i've made a rubens tube i have one at oh. home i love the rubens tube that is so neat yeah uh, and what a visual rep a wonderful visual representation of sound and you know fire yeah, fire, fire, exactly. So go, go ahead and explain the Rubens tube. I'm sure there are people who... Yeah, a Rubens tube, it, 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 the, the simplest description is it, it would be a, a, a long tube. I think we use uh, either PVC or uh, I'm forgetting the experiment right now. Um, you, you close it at one end. You draw holes at regular intervals across the top of the tube, and you fit the bottom or side of the tube so that you can feed uh, propane into it is, is what's commonly used. So you have a little propane canister along it. And then at the other end, you might have uh, like a, a membrane of some kind. You can uh, tape or, or uh, rubber band over some piece of rubber or whatever, something fairly thin. So you turn on the gas. You know, you've got gas starting to come out of the holes. You light all the holes, so you've got, basically it looks like a bunch of little candles going across the top of this tube. And then if you take a speaker and start playing music, actually the, the best, the coolest thing to do is you start with playing a simple, is it the 44.1 kilohertz tone? Yeah, or whatever pure the, tones. A pure tone into it. Yeah. And because of the way sound pressure works from the, the through the diaphragm, the differential waves down of the pressure of the air that's inside or the gases that are inside the tube will cause the flames to shape themselves into a sine wave. Yeah. And but then when you start playing music, you can actually get, it's, it's like creating your own visualizer for yeah, your, your own iTunes. visual EQ. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The, the, the Rubens tube I have at home is about, um, I think it was about five or six feet long so Ooh, good size. It's, yeah it, we, we get like one big long low wave and then you get you i think we got up to like up to like uh i can't remember how many times we were able to increase the frequency doing pure tones and getting getting actually um uh, well-defined waves but we were able to go from one big wave it was the wavelength of one pure tone and then dividing it again by two every time we increase the tone it was yeah anyway what point do the, the animals start fun. yelling out to you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> turn it off now mom turn oh. it off <laughs> Yeah, the Rubens tube is great. Uh, the microwave experiment is awesome. I was just thinking you could do chocolate and marshmallows and have mm. yourself—it's the modern day um, s'mores. Yeah, we just it's you know the, the 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 call for s'more science. S'more science. S'more science. I like it. I like it. So the the book for aspiring scientists. You you have before the first the the first couple of books are more like just geeky geekier stuff this is the only book that's really specifically science why correct why go why do a book that is specifically science well i mean you know with the first two books 
there was always a, an undertone of science. It was, you know, there were games, there were just, you know, really straight geek culture sort of things. But what was fun in, in many of them was, okay, let's try and try and make sure that there's something to learn there and that you're sort of sneaking in the education so that after, after you've done it with your kids, you, you, you had an, uh, an experience building together. You've had some fun doing something together. And then you could look back on it and go, well, you know, I, I learned how this worked that day too, whether it's, you know, building just the, the simple electronic fireflies. So now you've learned how current and light up an LED, things like that, to, to more complex. And it just seemed right that, okay, let's, let's do one that's more focused because the point of all these books has really been parents want to do stuff with their kids. They want to have fun exploring and doing projects with their kids. But so many times you run out of ideas. And so the idea for the books was let's give people a whole bunch of ideas that don't cost a lot that hopefully can be done with materials that you've got lying around the house and that will both entertain and educate. Um, and it came around to, all right, let's do one that's really more focused on that education aspect. I mean, there's still a lot of fun to be had, but this is also stuff that either, you know, parents doing it with their kids for the fun of education, or possibly these are, are good, crazy ideas to do an, an interesting science fair project. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I'm really interested in, in this interface between, I think, the geek tech kind of culture and in the science culture. Um, observe, uh, you know, observing so far, it seems like these are two completely different cultures where there are science people who kind of are into tech, you know, because they use tech stuff. There right. are tech people who, you know, like the odd science story and everything, but they don't really, they don't really mix that often. You don't really get a lot of the, the communication between the tech and the science. Do you see the, 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 the book that, that you've, this particular science education book and the, the others that you've done, do you, do you see that as kind of bridging the gap, bringing the worlds together? Sure. <laughs> Someone has space bats in the chat room just said the satellite hit Ken. <laughs> that's it. That's it. I'm so you know uh, having having been very young but alive when uh, Skylab came down. I'm still you know it'll it'll be interesting if it came down somewhere that people could see it. Yeah, it absolutely would. I mean the probabilities are against it for the right. most part. But northern uh, what is it? Northern England, uh, the UK, um, Africa. There are some pretty large swaths of land that, well, the satellite could hit people. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need it to hit people. We I just, know. you know, we need to see some, some good uh, camera phone video. Yeah, and this is, I think this is the, um, I think this is the, the largest satellite to come down since Skylab. The oh, largest wow. U.S. satellite, anyway, to come down since Skylab. So it's a pretty That we big... know of. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, conspiracy theories. You'd, you'd think with all the junk that's up there, we'd, we'd, we'd have rainstorms of bits and pieces coming down all the time. Yeah, but I think that, the, you know, most of the time things either stay up there or we know when they're going to come down or it's yeah. too small so it just burns up. Burns up. And it'll yeah. never make it. I think it's only big news when there's a possibility of it actually making landfall. Like this so we all have to run around screaming with our, you know, look out, look out. With our smartphones right. over our heads. I'll right, protect right. myself. Ah. Now get the video and I can sell it to CNN. <laughs> oh, it's raining satellite. Look at this. <laughs> I'm going to make a million dollars if I live. Anyway. Yeah, does your insurance cover that? <laughs> oh. Satellite? Is that like an act of God? I don't know. <laughs> I'd be worried. <laughs> Uh, how much of the last question did you get before I did, before you disappeared? Um, not enough. Not enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying something really intelligent, and then it went. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much how I ended it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> then yes, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Um, so the the question the question was um, 
So I, I just observing there, there seem to be these two communities. There's the tech community and there's the science community. And you have science people who are kind of into tech stuff because they use techie gadgets and things. And there's the tech community who, you know, they like the interesting science story, like faster than light neutrinos and that kind of thing. But they don't really talk to each other and they don't really, you don't have a lot of really gung-ho science enthusiasts in the tech community. I mean, they're not saying anything to people in the chat room. There are a lot out there, but yeah. it doesn't seem like we really have, it's like you're either all tech or you're not, you know, you're science or you're, you know, you can't be both. And do you see the books that you're, that you're writing, the stuff that you're doing as a way to bridge this, to bring the communities together? I hope so. I mean, I, I, I see, you know, I think some of the people that are in between, or not necessarily people that are in between, but the people that are bridging the gap because they're from one or the other side moving into the contrary camp, you know, the makers. Mm -hmm. And because there's so many people that are either from technology doing interesting stuff with what's available open source, or there's so many people from science doing crazy stuff with what they know about and coming together at places like Maker Fairs or, I don't know, Burning Man or a whole bunch of different places. And I, I think that's where our hope lies towards, you know, the, the two sides being able to communicate with each other and, and find common ground. And I, I am, I'm really excited about uh, having been involved in, in, things like Maker Faire, and that these books are sort of geared towards popularizing that sentiment, that idea that, um, you know, sometimes we forget that we can do things ourselves. And right. that there's a lot to be learned to remind ourselves that we can be self-sufficient and then that, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're forgetting some of the basics about, you know, how the world works. And we should go back and try some of this, even the, the, the really easy stuff, the simple stuff. The, as I said, you know, making fireflies, which is basically taping an LED to a battery, there's something to be learned there. And once you know how to do that, you can add components and you can get bigger and better. And you've learned some science, you've learned some electronics, and you've built something. And I, I think that's, that's where the, the, the twain can meet. Do you think that there's value in the uh, there? I know there's a movement beyond even just do it yourself maker type stuff toward the we need to know how to survive when the end of the world comes. You know, the, the kind of apocalyptic view of <laughs> technology is going to disappear at some point. We're not going to have it. You know, we have to know how to make a screw. <laughs> you know, I think that's that's sort of the postmodern equivalent of uh, anyone who ever thought that you know, revelations are going to come and the world will end. We, we, I think there's something ingrained in the way our, our brains work, in our, in our DNA, in our, in our psyches, that says because we don't understand some things, sooner or later it, it's all going to go away mm -hmm. and we're going to have to go back. I mean, it, it's, it's always been a fun... You know, there are a lot of geeks who like to think, you know, that, that you know, we were all fans of MacGyver when we were young. Absolutely. And, we, and we, we all like to imagine that we have enough knowledge of, of science, of physics, and of practical building and making that, yeah, okay, if suddenly somehow, and, and this would need to be almost magically, all technology failed, we could still get by and build ourselves log cabins and, and create incredibly complicated aqueduct systems to, you know, match the services that we have these days. It, it, it kind of does amuse me a little bit because has there ever been an event in history that we already know of wherein something happened other than, you know, war or, yeah. or, or, or to a lesser extent disease yeah. that would really cause that cataclysmic a change in the way things worked? I mean, even if, you know, if California, for example... Fell we got into hit. the ocean tomorrow. <laughs> well, and and that, that's not that likely. But if it was, yeah. you know, an eight-point earthquake, a nine-point earthquake, and, and, you know, the freeways are all broken down and uh, we can't get any power and the cell phone towers are down or whatever, that doesn't mean that civilization goes away. It just means that we are 
that first of all, we have crisis and crisis response, and we deal with the basics, and then slowly over time, we will get back to a certain point. People seem to think that it's like at some point, someone's going to hit a reset button, and we're back to the Stone Age, and that and that's never going to be the case. Right. On the other hand, it doesn't hurt to know how things work, and it doesn't hurt to have the basic knowledge and skills to survive in that crisis period so that you and your family and the people that you care about will be able to persevere until things get better again. Yeah. Do you think a scientific outlook will help people with stuff like that? Uh, a practical scientific outlook. You know, it can, it can never be all theory. It needs to be, you know, and of course, I would say that being an engineer. Yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you know, theory is great, but practical application is what gets you through the day. Yeah, so what's going to get you through the day is not necessarily the speed of light or whether it's, whether it's faster or slower. It's going to be uh, maybe knowing how much force you can put onto a beam when you're constructing something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the 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 propagation of of science and and techiness and geekiness, um, you know, what what more are you going to be looking at doing? What are you, you've got the Geek Dad blog that you edit, you publish. Um, you've got books. You've got the Geek Mom blog as well. Are you are you moving into movies soon? Uh, actually. <laughs> The, 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 this is this is the bizarre experience that running Geek Dad has been. There is actually potential for a movie. Uh, there, it is in development. Nice. We'll we'll just put it there. And my 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 dread is that it turns it has nothing to do with science and 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 it just becomes a silly family comedy. But my hope is is that it would be able to be instilled with. At least on the sly, some of the you know the, the science and really interesting creative things that people are are doing and building uh, these days. So, you know, we'll see where that goes. That that's but that's entertainment. That's magic. I you know, I want to continue evangelizing this movement. This you know, geek is popular right now in some way, shape, or form. And you know, knowing the way culture goes. It will it will fade again, and the geeks will once again be shoved into lockers and 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 no, ignored. No, say it isn't so. <laughs> no, but we'll rise up. There you go. The geek <laughs> the geeks shall inherit the earth. Exactly. Well, I, you know, as long as we're as long as we're running the tech companies, maybe maybe we'll be okay. But you know, I want to make sure that you know people understand that science is important. Technology isn't something to be afraid of. One of the one of the big, you know most common questions that we get asked when we do panels at various places is, you know, how do I deal with the fact that my kids have cell phones and and you know there is no etiquette established for a lot of the stuff that's happening these days because we're getting new devices with new capabilities yep. like every month. So. I, you know, I try to give people a sense that whilst the tools are changing, the sort of the activities and the goals and the ideas are the same as they were 50 years ago. You know, all right, your kid has the ability to talk on the phone that's in their pocket now rather than the, the daughter in the classic sitcom having the phone with the 50-foot cord trailed up the stairs and sitting in a room with the door closed. It's, exactly. Kids want to communicate, and so you got to figure out how to make that work within an appropriate framework. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it comes down to also, you know, teaching teaching kids. If if you're teaching them values, if you're teaching them, you know, how to communicate with um, within society's rules, being polite, being you know, having respect for others. I mean, that translates to technology. It's not right. you know, that's not so, technology is like this separate. I think when it comes to questions like. You know, like how behavior, how do you behave? How, how do we teach kids to behave? It's like you teach, I, you, I don't think you separate the technology out into its own little category. Yeah, you don't, don't take the technology away. Just, you know, teach them how to use it appropriately. Mm -hmm. Teach them and how that, to be a good person. Right. <laughs> how many and then they'll completely ignore you and go out and get 15 piercings, 12 tattoos, and, mm -hmm. you know. That's what, that's what I did. <laughs> My dad was like, "No earrings." So I got drink my bad coffee. Course. You know, it's <laughs> no ear, no more than one pair of earrings. Okay, I'll get my <laughs> ears pierced a number more times. 
yes, that didn't go over so well, Dad. Yeah, I remember, I remember you know, it, it's not in there anymore, but I remember when I came home with that pierced ear and my folks were like, really? really? What is Wait this? till your grandmother sees this. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. How many kids do you have? I have two boys. They are nearly 12 and a little older than 13. Um, and how one, long have you been doing Geek Dad, the blog? It's about four and a half years now since okay. uh, I actually took it over. It was actually started by, uh, you know, Chris Anderson, the, the uh, editor-in-chief of Wired, Wired Magazine. Yeah. Yeah, he, start, he started it as sort of a little pet project to, to, to go over the projects he was doing with his kids and, and with his friends. And he's big into uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Nice. And so those were the projects he started out with. And, um, and yeah, I, so I got into it pretty early just because it was, you know, the perfect fit for me. And after a while, he decided it was becoming too much for him. And I was the lucky recipient of his entrepreneurial spirit. And it's been an, an amazing ride since then. Yeah. Has it, do you, I mean, do you, obviously a lot of it is taken from what you're doing with your kids and like and and how you're interacting with them um you know how often is there just you know something that happens that you're like oh my goodness this thing i never thought would happen you know with with my kids somebody the kids said something or this project came up that we never never even thought we we could do but we did like how often do, do these surprises happen when you're when you're putting your blog together uh, you know, every now and then, I mean, it's been, it's, there have been things, um, and they're not always sciencey, but they're, they're cool. And, and my kids never cease to amaze me with the things that they'll, the ideas they'll have, uh, completely separate from anything I've ever taught them. Uh, you know, for example, my, my, uh, older son, uh, back uh, when he was in fourth grade, and if, uh, if you ever lived in California, one of the educational standards here is in fourth grade, you have to do your mission project, some sort of project doing that. Yeah. having to do with the, with the California missions. Mm -hmm. And usually, you know, there's in, in any hobby shop in California, you can go buy prepackaged model kits to build your California mission or, or some other thing you're going to do. And my son at that time was a huge fan of Ace of Cakes. So he decided to make his mission out of cake. Cool. And so we explored what the materials were. We had, you know, we had a, a local bakery that we really liked, and we talked to them about it, and they let him come in and use their their uh, restaurant grade uh, airbrush for coloring things. Oh, and neat. he built this awesome cake model of a uh, of a uh, of a California mission, and uh, so. I had to write it up for the blog and it, it actually made it in as a project in the first book and it, it's things like that that just, you know, kids are awesome. Kids, kids are totally awesome. Um, you have two boys. Um, how many of the other writers for Geek Dad, Geek Mom um, have girls and is there, do you see a difference in the way that projects are done with girls versus boys or is it pretty equin, equ, equinanimous? That's the word. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's the right word. Uh, um, you know what, what is an interesting sentiment and, and almost a movement inside um, the geek community, at least the circles that, that, I, that I, all these folks that I know is, uh, and there's a great t-shirt on a site called Think Geek, if you know them. It says, self-rescuing princess. Nice. And uh, that's what you're seeing. That's what I see in a lot of geek parents is that you have girls and on the one hand, absolutely, they're, they're women. They're young women. They're going to grow up to be women and have all of the, you know, all of the likes and wants and, you know, uh, personality traits that are appropriate. On the other hand, we don't, whilst there's a, there's a societal you know, hook towards pulling them to being princesses and being and, and and this concept of the defenseless woman who can't who needs someone to save her. We don't like that. That's not that's not real. That's not practical. That's not you know. Uh, it's not a way you want your 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 kid to grow up. You want your right. kids to be self reliant. So we want the girls that we're raising to be as smarter, smarter than the boys in science and math and building things and doing things for themselves and being creative and so forth. So we want, we want self-rescuing princesses. 
<laughs> I think that's a I think it's a fabulous sentiment. And so for all of you out there who are interested in uh, self rescuing princesses. You have to go to wired.com slash geek dad. You can go to, it's also geekdad.com. There's also geek mom if you are a mom and you want to find out geeky things that, um, that moms are thinking about. Um, that's a great resource. And I think Carrie, Bry Carrie Byron writes occasionally for geek mom, doesn't she? She does. It's, it's been wonderful. Every, every month or two, she will write a, write a piece for us. And uh, she's, she's so much fun. She is so cool. Yeah, she's she's absolutely fabulous. She's got a new science program that's for kids that's promoting science and you know, we've got I, I just love it. There's this I, I think you and so many other people are out promoting self reliance, intelligence, um, questioning, you know, the world, trying to figure things out for themselves, um, you know, the ethics of, of science and technology and geekery. Geekery and nerddom. Exactly. Reminding people that science is, isn't mystical. It's not, you know, when, when it boils down to it, a science, you know, a person who is a scientist is someone that follows basic steps to figure something out. And it, that's it. That, that, that's, that's the entire description right there. And so um, when you see, when you're, you get your, your blood boils about people in politics or whatever, being negative about scientists saying this or that, you know, it, it, you got to shake your head because you know what, there's nothing wrong with scientists or science. If it's done correctly, yeah. it's, it's independent of what your opinion is. Yep. Absolutely. Let me look at your, uh, your workshop back there. So do you have any, <laughs> do you have any amazing, I've been kind of glimpsing Whoop. the background. Uh oh, you're losing. Uh oh, the, the, the Death Star just fell away. Oh, but, no. uh, not the Death Star. Although I did, let's see, there is there is there is that Death Star too. Nice. Have That's you seen the, Have you uh, seen the comic that was? Um, oh, what's the the planet that gets blown up by the Death Star? Yes. Oh, the the animated GIF of yeah. uh, Alderaan, Alderaan shot, shot first. Alderaan shot first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fantastic. There's the uh, so science stuff. This is this is actually a uh, uh, a proper Diet Coke and Mentos. Loader. Trigger, loader. Nice. Actually sent to me by the guys at EB Bird. Nice. Those guys are awesome. They're, they're a ton of fun. And yeah, there's a bunch of, here's, uh, here's uh, the Skitterbot. Skitterbot. That looks like uh, basically, it is uh, motor. Uh, this was actually something we picked up and built at Maker Faire. And it's a simple spinning motor, but with the, you know, two regular legs. And one leg is the spinning motor, so it just Spinners. all over the place. You build, yeah. you you put it together, assemble it yourself, and then it it's a bot. Yeah, they had they had kits, and all the kids were building them at Maker Fair. So there's all sorts. Of, I've I've got a, a a geeky wall of shame up here that's just uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think I think all geeks out there should have a geeky wall of shame, and they should submit those pictures to. Geek Dad, so that everybody can can share. <laughs> that would be that would be a good one. Actually, we did we shot a, a video here for Wired uh, uh, last week, and we used it as the backdrop. So it'll be online pretty soon. You'll be able to see all my all my Stargate and Battlestar Galactica stuff. And there's a Dalek up here. There's Robbie the robot. You know, all the good stuff. All of it. Thank you very much for joining me today, Ken. This has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I'm so glad I was able to finally finally come on, Kiki. I've been yeah. uh, I've been following you on Twitter and and all your stuff for so long. It's finally did, finally great to have a conversation. Absolutely. So geekdad.com or wired.com forward slash geekdad. Is there any place else that people can follow you online? I know uh, Twitter, Twitter handle is Fitzwilly. F I T Z W I L L I E. Uh, you can check out more about the Geek Dad books at geekdadbook.com. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much everything. Awesome. All right, everybody. I'm Dr. Kiki, and this has been the Science Hour. Dr. Kiki Science Hour. My Science Hour. But, you know, it's shared with you, so it's really your Science Hour. Next week, we're going to be talking about squid. Squids. That's right. I do like a good squid. So we'll be talking about squid next week. And until then, you can follow my science-y pursuits around the internet. Uh, Dr. Kiki on Twitter. I am Kiki Sanford on Google Plus because they do not. Because you can't be Dr. Kiki. I no. Cannot. <laughs> 
I cannot. Even though there are tons <sighs> of doctors on Google Plus who have not been. Yeah. Anyway, we won't go there. Right. Facebook, I also have a Dr. Kiki page. And uh, you can email me at drkiki at drkiki.tv. You can also go to my website, drkiki.tv, if you're interested. So until next week, thank you for tuning into my science hour. Remember, all I ask is one hour a week. I do hope that it makes your world a whole lot more interesting. I'll see you later. And now for your science meditation of the week. There we go. So, what are we really made of? Dig deep inside the atom and you'll find tiny particles held together by invisible forces. Everything is made up of tiny packets of energy born in cosmic furnaces. The atoms that we're made of have negatively charged electrons whirling around a big bulky nucleus. The quantum theory offers a very different explanation of our world. The universe is made of 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature. The universe is made of 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature. That's a wonderful and significant story. Suppose that little things behave very differently than anything big. Nothing's really as it seems. It's so wonderfully different than anything big. The world is a dynamic mess of tingling things. It's hard to believe. The quantum theory is so strange and bizarre. Even Einstein couldn't get his head around it. In the quantum world, the world of particles, nothing is certain. It's a world of probability. The quantum theory offers a very different explanation of our world. The universe is made of 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature. The universe is made of 12 particles of matter, four forces of nature. That's a wonderful and significant story. Use my super ninja skills. Whack, whack, whack. Hiya! <laughs> <laughs> I just made the shark happy. Mm hmm.